All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this paper called On the Expressive Power of Programming Languages by Matthias Felleisen. Uh, this is the this is the paper. This is a paper from about 1992, I think, um, and it answers this question or attempts to answer this question of wh what do we mean when we say things like syntactic sugar, right? We we don't think of adding, for example, on this slide, a for loop, this repeat statement. We don't think of adding a for loop as being an expressive change to a language that already has while loops in it, right? Because uh, we can just uh, execute the initial statement and then execute a while loop that executes the statement until the expression is not true, right? So this repeat statement actually doesn't have the semantics of a for loop because it, it executes the statement once, but think of it as like a do while and a while. Um, right, similarly, uh, here's another example of something that we consider to be syntactic sugar. For example, a let statement in a language that already has functions, right? So a let statement just says, I can bind a variable x to some value in an expression. Well, that's the same as just having a lambda function over that same expression e with a binder x and then applying that thing to v. We think of those two things as the same thing. Um, but what do we mean when we say that the first thing, the thing on the left, is expressible as the thing on the right? Um, or in the same vein, what do we mean when we say that adding a feature does add expressive power, meaning that it is not already expressible um, using the features in the language? How do we pin that down? So just to summarize, we're, we're concerned with this question of, does some feature f add uh, expressive power to some language l? That's the question that we're attempting to answer. And so you might think that Turing completeness uh, has something to say in, in this matter. But um, actually, if you think about it for you know, 10, 20 more seconds, you start to realize that the only distinction that we can make between languages with respect to Turing completeness is one is Turing complete and another one isn't, right? So here's, that doesn't work. Uh, and just to show you why, here are some examples of Turing complete languages. We have x86 machine code, right? We have PowerPoint, PowerPoint is Turing complete. Uh, we have Redstone in Minecraft, all of these Turing complete languages and yet we think of even between these three languages, the expressiveness is totally different and equally uh, terrible. Um, whereas, you know, languages like OCaml or C or even Assembly are all more preferable language to languages to these, and indeed provide completely different features to all of these things. So, that's a totally uh, that's a total red herring, the idea of Turing completeness. Okay, so what about a definition that attempts to answer this question by saying that we can compile the language L with F included down to just the language L, right? So I have a language with while loops. Um, I add a feature of for loops. Well, F uh, for loops must not have been an expressive addition because I can compile that down to uh, just the language with the while loops. Well, we're getting a little bit closer, but this still does not quite capture the examples that we looked at before, because what about things like mutable state? So mutable state, for example, if we, if we take this example on the left, this is a, a little bit of JavaScript. This is just a function that's going to go over a tree. We're gonna have some global variable, last was a, and we're going to go over a tree and we're going to see if there are two consecutive nodes in the tree um, that have an A followed by uh, a B as their data contents. And so you can see that, for example, in the first nested if statement, if tree bin equals equals A, 
Um, then we're gonna set this global variable, we're gonna mutate it to be the value true, right? And similarly on other recursive calls, we're gonna have access to that global mutable variable um, to see if we had found A previously. Um, so, you know, nothing crazy going on in this function, but uh, if any of you listening are Haskell programmers, you know that we can encode this in a so-called store passing style where rather than keeping a global variable, we can instead change the a then b function to take an additional parameter, which is the conceptual global state of the function beforehand, last was a. And um, so whenever we want to read the global variable, we just look at the value that was passed into the function. And whenever we want to write to the global variable, we return uh, not only the result that we want to return, but also the new value of the global variable. Um, but notice that when we performed this transformation, contrary to the while loop transformation and the let binding transformation, that we had to add a new parameter to this function. Uh, in the while loop and the let binding, we were doing a local transformation. We didn't even have to care where those uh, statements or expressions appeared inside of the larger program. Uh, we could just replace them in a local fashion and not care about the context. Uh, it didn't matter what the context was. Here, if we wanted to replace this mutation on the left, last was a equals true, um, we could replace it with the thing on the right, which is return result false last was a colon true, but we also have to change the context that that uh, mutation occurs in, the function. And even the callers of this function, uh, we'll have to change those because they previously, in the example on the left, the function returned one value and took one value. Now we're going to have to change the rest of our program to call it the function with two values and um, accept two values as the result of the function. So this is, this is a, a global transformation. Um, it's not a structure preserving transformation. In other words, features of the language that did not sort of change, like functions, are being modified as a result of adding this feature to the language. Um, and yet this satisfies our previous definition, which was that we can compile L plus F to L. We can compile uh, JavaScript plus mutation to JavaScript without mutation by performing this store passing uh, compilation. So this is this is not quite capturing expressiveness either. So this brings us to the first key idea of this paper, which is the idea of a homomorphism or a structure preserving mapping, where that mapping is in the parlance that I've been using, a compiler. Uh, in other words, we want not just a compiler, but a compiler that translates every kind of construct other than the one that we added to itself. So it compiles functions to functions that don't look any different. It compiles plus to plus. It compiles, um, you know, whatever else, if to if. But then if we add some feature f, when it encounters that feature f, it's allowed to do whatever it wants. So if we look back at this example, uh, I just want to impress upon you that um, in order to compile full programs that contain repeats in them, we can just compile the outer context, the thing surrounding this expression that you see in front of you, to itself. And then when we hit this inner expression, we perform the transformation to a while loop. Similarly for this let binding. So this is this is the key feature that these that these two expressions have. This captures our intuition about syntactic sugar. And so now what we have to do is we have to dive into some definitions and I'm going to try and go through them quickly because they're dense, but uh, your intuition you can rely on. Um, so we have three different distinct features of a programming language in terms of our formalization. We have a set of L phrases. These are just the abstract syntax trees. Uh, 
these function symbols f f1 are the ast nodes so, right so stuff like plus plus is a function symbol of arity 2 meaning it takes two arguments um, similarly uh, note that the arity can be zero right so for constants like true false three seven these things uh, are still considered function symbols, but they have arity zero, meaning they take zero arguments. So again, the set of L phrases is just a set of abstract syntax trees. The set of L programs is a subset of the set of L phrases, and these are just well-defined L phrases. So well-definedness could be something like well-scoping, right? A full program an L program, a full program does not have free variables in it because I don't know what to do with those. And simil similarly, a full L program may or may not, depending on the language L, uh, be typed, in which case um, programs are only those which are well typed. And it has an operational semantics. Uh, recall that this paper is from 1992. And so it, it's very much following the style of Plotkin where we define a partially computable function. And the idea is that the partial part of this partially computable function uh, means that it's not defined precisely when evaluation doesn't terminate, right? So we can have programs that may not terminate. And in that case, the function is undefined and, or partial, in other words. And we take L programs, not L phrases, but L programs, only things that are well-defined or are um, well formed to a set of some L answers. You can think of these perhaps as values, but it's not going to matter for us because we're going to reduce this entire problem down to just does it terminate or not, which is going to be surprising perhaps, but we're going to be able to do it. So the only thing that we actually care about is its termination behavior rather than what answer it produces. And I'll show you an example of that later. So just as an example, this, this while loop, uh, for loop example that we've been, I should stop saying for loop, I think it's actually do while um, that, we've, that we've been looking at. Um, more formally as an L phrase, repeat S until E would be repeat dash until as a two arity function symbol that takes two sub expressions, or I guess a statement and expression S and E. Here's some examples of things that may be phrases, but not programs. Again, this is all parametric on the language L, so there's a lot of different decisions that you can make. But the first thing, lambda x dot x y, that's not well scoped because y appears free. So it doesn't count as a full program because we don't know what to do with y. So it's not well formed. Similarly, down here, we have something that's well scoped, right? x is the only variable and it, it appears under a lambda, so it has a binder but we've declared that x has type int and that we're using boolean true uh, or boolean and with true. So it's well scoped, but it's not well typed. So this is a phrase, but not a program according to that definition. Okay, so we have languages now. We know what a language is. What is a sublanguage? Well, it's exactly what you expect it to be. Uh, the constructors of, okay, so First of all, the syntax that we're going to use is that we have some language L and that we're going to use this set difference notation with a bunch of function symbols. So you can think of L set difference F1 through Fn is a language L minus the constructs that we're removing, right? So for example, maybe your language is has do whiles and while loops, um, then maybe you want to you want to take out do while loops, then you would say L set minus um, curly brace, do while, curly brace. And then the thing without the do while is a sublanguage. Uh, so the FIs are the thing, the constructs that we're removing are constructs that actually exist in L. That's this first statement. The second statement is saying that the phrases in the language, the sublanguage from which we have removed a construct is a subset of the L phrases. Basically, the ASTs of the, of the sublanguage are a subset of the ASTs of the full language. The programs of the sublanguage are a subset of the programs of the super language. Maybe that's the phraseology I'll use. 
And finally, um, perhaps maybe a little less obvious, is that the semantics have to agree for the sublanguage with the superlanguage. Um, so for any program in the sublanguage, L set minus F1 through Fn, uh, if I run that program, uh, it better give me the same result as uh, running the program in the in the super language. Okay, so that's a sub language. Nothing surprising yet. Syntactic abstraction. This seems very complicated, but uh, I want you to think of it just as a fancy uh, definition for a macro. So uh, if I have some M, M is basically, uh, you can think of it as the same set of ASTs as the language, except that anywhere that I have a sub-expression, I can choose instead to place um, an alpha. And then later on, I can replace that alpha with some other expression, right? So if my macro M, this first bullet, if my macro M is just an alpha, then I'm going to replace the corresponding alpha with the expression in the same position um, when I apply that macro. Uh, similarly, if the macro is a function symbol, that function symbol has some arity, and uh, I'm going to recursively expand the macro in each of the argument positions with all of the same expressions as the original invocation of the macro. So there's nothing there's nothing spooky going on here. It's literally just inlining E1 through EN anywhere that it sees A1 through AN, alpha one through alpha N. That's all that's going on. And if that's confusing, we'll see some examples later. Okay, here's another perhaps crazy example, but uh, it's simpler than it seems. Uh, we're introducing this idea of a syntactic environment row. Uh, they've defined it as a finite map from constructors, so things like do while, to or repeat until, to um, to macros, and then uh, an expansion uh, of that specification of that row is just an application of those macros. So. Um, and the intuition here is that row is only going to contain constructs that we are, in this case, removing from the language. So this is all a little backwards from the way that we think about things. We think about taking some base language L, L prime, and adding a bunch of Fs. Uh, but this is all phrased in terms of L prime being a sublanguage of L by removing the Fs. So. Um, if, uh, if F isn't in the map, then we don't do anything to the expression during it, to the, to the construct during expansion. That's what this first bullet is saying. Uh, the second bullet is saying, if we do have a macro associated with, the, with F, then um, we are going to expand F to that macro with the expanded versions of F's uh, arguments. So here's a little example down at the bottom. We just have that we, we, we are defining row. You can think of row as our local compiler, as our compiler that's going to leave everything the same, but uh, replace instances of our added language feature with a macro for that language feature. So our row is going to replace, re replace instances of repeat until with this macro this syntactic abstraction, this thing, this syntactic, syntactic abstraction. And that syntactic abstraction that we're gonna replace it with is alpha one while not alpha two do alpha one. And so if we expand the expression repeat S until E uh, with the syntactic environment row above, then we can see that this is how the expansion is going to go. So technically speaking, the sequ sequ sequencing semicolon is a different operator than the do while or the, the while loop, which is technically a separate operator from the negation. But uh, 
So you can see that the first the first thing that we do is we attempt to macro expand um, repeat s until e. Okay, so we replace it with the uh, syntactic abstraction uh, alpha one while not alpha two do alpha one, and then uh, we want to replace those meta variables alpha one alpha two alpha one with uh, s and e respectively, and so you can see how the execution goes. Um, because uh, because the expansion of S is in the first position, it replaces uh, alpha 1. Because the expansion of E is in the second position, it replaces alpha 2. And we end up with the thing that you expect. And we have to recursively call the expansion on S, E, and S. Because we might have more repeat statements inside of those things that we also want to expand. But again, I want to stress that you can think of this at a high level if this is all confusing to you. What is a syntactic expansion? What is an environment? What is an abstraction? It's just macro expansion. It's just macro expansion. OK, so this brings us to our the, the big definition of this paper, which is the definition of expressibility. So it's a little bit of a mouse, mouthful and it's a little bit subtle, but the uh, the motto is show me the macro. If you want to say that some language um, L prime, uh, sorry, uh, right. If you want to say that some language L prime can express a feature F, then all you have to do is uh, give me a macro that expands f out into the language without f, um, feature f. So let's, let's break down this definition a little bit. Um, so L, L is our big language with feature f. We have f1 through fn here, but let's just think about one feature. We have our language L, which contains feature f. And then we have L prime, which is L, but without F. Um, then L prime, the sublanguage, uh, can express the syntactic facilities, in other words, the feature F, if, and you can, you can ignore with respect to L prime, um, it's, not, it's not too important. If for, for that new feature that we added, there's some macro M, such that for every program, for every program in the language, the super language, um, if we run that program, it terminates if and only if the macro expanded program terminates. So let me say that again. Uh, we have our super language L, we have our sub language L prime. We say that, you can see I'm getting a little bit confused reading it. We, we say that um, L prime can express F if for every program in L, the super language, evaluation, if for every program P in the super language L, P terminates if and only if evaluation of macro expansion of P terminates. So in other words, give me a program. Okay, now give me the macro expansion of that same program. Are they, do they both show the ter same termination behavior? Okay, now check it for every single program. And this is the key. Right, so this, this may be spooky to you, or this may be seem wrong, because we're, we're just checking termination here. Right, so let me let me propose something. Here's a macro. Uh, this macro is going to take every any integer in my language and it's going to compile it to unit. Right, so this is the unit value of OCaml or Haskell that is like open paren, close paren in OCaml. Um, so it's going to take every integer, doesn't matter which one, and compile it to unit. So here I have an example that seven macro expands to unit. So uh, 
This seems to satisfy our definition. Here's a macro that expresses that all numbers are the unit value. And this appears to be saying that numbers are no more expressive than unit, right? Because obviously the program integer terminates and the program unit terminates. So what's going on here? Uh, well, the trick is that this definition is for all L programs P, right? So it's not just programs that are integer literals, it's programs like the one to the bottom right, right? So this, this program down here, if integer, huh, blah, then star else omega, omega is the infinite looping program. The uh, top example is the evaluation of the original program P in my super language. And the bottom example is the evaluation of the macro expansion of P in my sub language, namely the one where I have, I have macro expanded any integer down to unit. And so you can see that these two programs exhibit different termination behavior. And so in fact, this macro does not satisfy the definition of uh, expressibility. In other words, this macro is uh, the programming language with, with integers cannot uh, express the uh, program without integers. And so for those of you who are familiar with this idea of observational or contextual equivalence, this trick that I just played should seem familiar. I took two things that would seem to be the same and I wrapped them in a context which can tell them apart. So um, let's just remind ourselves what the definition of observational equivalence is. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's it's uh, subtle and, and confusing and uh, I would spend way too much time talking about it and I'm already seven minutes over 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna remind you of the definition, which is that two arbitrary expressions are considered equivalent. If for any context that I might wrap them in, uh, evaluation of that context with E1 plugged in terminates if and only evaluation of that context with E2 plugged in terminates. And this should look very similar to the definition for expressibility, um, and that's not a coincidence. So um, I would like to point out that uh, adding expressive power to your language um, is not a panacea, uh, right? So here. This, this example is displaying to you that according to this definition of contextual equivalence, uh, two plus three is not contextually equivalent to five. Why? Because I can wrap them in the context which monkey patches the integer class to define plus to return the constant seven. So uh, when I add a feature to my language, like overloading in this case, uh, the intuition that you should have is that that's if it's if it's an expressive feature in the way that we've talked about, um, it's probably going to break observational equivalence. In other words, if I do happen to break observ another way of of flipping that around is if I do happen to break observational equivalence, you might expect that that f feature that I added cannot possibly be expressive. And indeed, this is the main theorem of this paper. The main theorem of this paper is, is um, sub-theorem I here. This is saying let you know equivalence sub-0 and equivalence sub-1 be the observational, here it says operational, but it's just another name for observational equivalence relations for the superlanguage, for the sub-language and the superlanguage respectively. This first bullet is saying uh, if that feature breaks any of the equivalences that hold in the sublanguage, if adding that feature breaks any of the equivalences that hold in the sublanguage, then that means that uh, the sublanguage cannot possibly express the feature. In other words, it is an expressive addition to the sublanguage. 
And the intuition for this theorem uh, comes from contextual equivalence. And the basic idea is that, so the, 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 a proof sketch is attempt to prove it by contradiction. Assume that, um, first of all, that adding the feature uh, breaks contextual equivalence. Okay, so what does it mean to break contextual equivalence? It means that um, there's some context in the, in the super language that can tell apart two expressions which were indistinguishable in the subcontext. Right, so going back to our Ruby example, without overloading, two plus three and five are indistinguishable from one another. But now I've added overloading, and now I can distinguish them, right? Because here's my context. It's this, it's the context that monkey patches addition. Okay, so that's that's what that first assumption means. It means that there's some context that I can show you which distinguishes these two expressions. Great. Now, for a contradiction, assume that the conclusion is not true, namely that L0 can express the facilities F1 through Fn. In other words, uh, the sublanguage, Ruby without overloading, can express Ruby with overloading. Um, what does that mean? Well, let's return to our definition for expressiveness. It means that no matter what program you give me, I can give you a macro that retains the semantics for every program. Okay, great. So I'm assuming that there is a macro. Basically, if L0 can express the facility F, there's a macro for expanding overloading into a language without overloading. This should immediately be very suspicious to you. Um, and you, you arrive at a contradiction from the fact that, first of all, the translation is homomorphic, meaning it doesn't mess with anything except for instances of the new construct, in this case, overloading. And second, uh, so we assumed that there is some distinguishing context. Uh, but in the sublanguage, E0 and E1, the two expressions that are different in the super language, uh, are indistinguishable. So let's, let's run our macro. Okay, after we run our macro, there's no more instances of overloading anymore. The only thing that's changed uh, is that we've taken the, the instances of overloading and that we've replaced them via macro with something else. But one of our assumptions was that in the smaller language, E0 and E1 are indistinguishable, right? They had to have been indistinguishable before, and then we find some context that distinguishes them after. So in the sublanguage, they're indistinguishable. But the only difference is that we have macro expanded some stuff. Right? So this is, this is a contradiction. We assumed that, um, that the context C could distinguish between E0 and E1, but it can't possibly distinguish between E0 and E1 because the expanded program is purely made up of features of L0, which couldn't distinguish them. So if that doesn't make any sense, it doesn't matter. Uh, the motivation for this first theorem is that this gives you a way to prove that a language feature is expressible. Uh, if you can show that, given some language, when I add a feature, it breaks an equivalence, an observational equivalence, then you, then you know that that language feature can't, can't be expressed with a macro. In other words, it's an expressive change. It can't be, it can't be encoded using syntactic sugar. And it's very easy to show this, right? Because all you have to do in order to show that contextual equivalence has been broken is give me one context, show me one context and two expressions that were the same before, but are distinguished after, right? Very easy, as we can see from this example, to show, uh, give a context that shows that something is an expressive addition.
So the second part of the theorem is a little bit uh, is a little bit strange. Um, it's not intuitive, and uh, I don't really feel like I even understand it completely. Um, I'll tell you what it says. It says that the converse of the first part of the theorem doesn't hold, namely that there there are language features which are not expressive uh, or which cannot be expressed um, in, in some language. So in other words, there are language features that you can't write a macro for, uh, but they don't, they don't break any equivalences. Namely, then uh, th this, is, this is a good property. This means that there are, there are language features that I can add that are a fundamental addition in, in expressive power but which aren't doing crazy things like violating equivalences that I would have liked to have before. Uh, it's like a, it's a feature that you can add such that two plus three is still equal to five, but you can write more programs than you could have written before. Um, and express the compilation as a macro. And so this is, so the canonical example of number two uh, so this number two is saying that the converse of one does not hold so whenever you want to show something doesn't hold you give a counter example the counter example to this is in terms of control operators call cc and abort uh, you can read the paper for the example i'm not going to talk about it but um, it's, it's pretty interesting and and the fact that these language features exist is um, is compelling because we would like to find them. There are things that we can add to our language um, for free, essentially. We can add them and not break any of the equivalences that people thought held before. So there's a ton more in the paper that I have not talked about whatsoever. And um, we can talk about them on uh, we can talk about those things on Thursday when we meet. I think we're going to meet. But in the meantime, I'll leave you with these sort of final thoughts, which uh, the first one is that this definition of expressibility provides a, a mathematically precise definition uh, or explanation for syntactic sugar, uh, which agrees with our intuition. And, and similarly, the other side of the same coin, the definition for not expressible, in other words, an addition of expressive power, um, provides uh, an appropriate definition or intuition for features which do add power to a language. To prove that a feature is expressible, in other words, it's mere syntactic sugar, you just show me the macro, show me the syntactic sugar, to prove that a feature does add power or that it's not expressible, um, you have to show me a context. Well, you may show me a context that can distinguish two terms which were not distinguishable before you added that feature. But like part two of this theorem says, there, there may not be a way to do that. Um, it may be that contextual equivalence is preserved, but it's still adds expressive power. And finally, there's this idea that uh, making a language more expressive does not necessarily make it more ergonomic. And I think this is an important point. And um, this is one important feature of this paper that it attempts to bridge a gap between language theory and human computer interaction or psychology. Um, and the way that it bridges this gap is it says, look, there's this formal thing called observational equivalence and adding a feature uh, will probably, in almost all cases, it will betray your intuition about the equivalence of expressions that may have held beforehand, but do not hold now. And so in that sense, adding the feature, okay, yes, maybe some programs are easier to write having added that feature, uh, but the overall ergonomic feeling of your language can actually decrease because of examples like this, right? People can sort of wreak havoc on your programs by doing crazy things like overloading plus on the integer class in Ruby. <laughs>
Okay, so uh, the last thing I'll say is that I'm going to post on Piazza. I'm going to post a talk given by Sri Ram Krishnamurthy uh, at the Papers We Love conference. Also on this paper, I modeled this talk very heavily on his, and he's an excellent teacher. I would strongly encourage you, if this is interesting to you, but you were confused by my presentation or you were confused by the paper, to go watch that presentation. It contains a lot more examples than my presentation did, and um, there's some uh, you know, back and forth between an audience. It's a little bit more interactive. Um, so I'll post that on Piazza. Uh, I hope this was useful to you. Um, please reach out if you have any questions about this paper um, or if you're interested at all. I'm happy to talk more about it on Thursday or anytime in the future. Thanks.